and welcome everyone. So thanks for joining us for today's Comrade Sci virtual talk. My name is Meredith Jagudis. I'm Senior Director of Development in MSU's College of Communication Arts and Sciences, a college devoted to storytelling and the way we communicate and connect. And several months ago when everything went remote, we watched our alumni quickly adapt and pivot and we discovered quite an interest in the behind the scenes aspects of different Comrade Sci careers. So that just generated this webinar series about media and communication pivoting in the pandemic and leads us to today's talk. I think this is our seventh or eighth conversation um, and today is about healthcare, as you know. So we are excited to be able to provide this opportunity and conversation and attendees will note that your microphone and video camera are off, but we really encourage you to ask questions through the talk feature or the Q&A feature in Zoom and we'll moderate that as we go. And also please make sure that you tag us today with hashtag ComArtSciTalks. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Bree Holtz. Dr. Holtz is an associate professor now in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations and is also the director of the college's Health and Risk Communication Master's Program, which I believe is celebrating its 25th anniversary, if I'm not mistaken. 20th, 25th? Uh, 21st. 21st, okay, thanks, yes. Bree. Uh, Bree is also an alum, having received both her BA in telecommunication and her PhD in media and information studies from MSU and from the college specifically, with a quick stop in between at the London School of Economics for her MSc in information systems. She completed her postdoctoral training at the VA Ann Arbor Healthcare System and joined Comart Sci faculty as faculty in 2012 and is also last year's recipient of the college's Faculty Impact Award. So we're excited to have her as our moderator today. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to Bree to introduce our Spartan panel. Great, thank you, Meredith. I'm excited uh, to be a part of this panel and to have these great um, alumni and to have a conversation about healthcare in the pandemic, which I think has seen a lot of pivoting. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll start with Lois. Uh, Lois is a chief community executive at MultiCare Health System. MultiCare is a not-for-profit care organization with more than 20,000 team members, nine hospitals, an extensive ambulatory network serving both adults and children. She joined MultiCare in 1998 and has overseen both support and clinical departments, including marketing and communication, philanthropy, sorry, philanthropy, uh, adult day, day health, home health and hospice, nutrition services, healthy living, and health equality and government affairs. Lois currently oversees MultiCare's community presence and partnerships with organizations in MultiCare's broad service area. Thank you, Lois, for joining us today in a West Coast yes. <laughs> time zone. Uh, next, Mary. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mary is president of the Healthcare Leadership Council, a coalition of chief executives of the nation's leading health care companies and organizations. The HLC advocates consumer-centered health care reform, emphasizing the value of private sector innovation. It is the only health policy advocacy group that represents all sectors of the health care industries. She was appointed to that position in August of 1999. Thank you, Mary, for joining. I did to be and here. Thanks. And last but not least, uh, Gail is a clinical associate professor and director of the speech language hearing clinic at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. She's also the audiology faculty member on the leadership education and neurodevelopmental and other disorders grant at the Nysonger, is that correct? Nysonger. Nysonger, thank you. Center at Ohio State, a maternal and child health training grant. Dr. Whitelaw has been fortunate to be involved with leadership aspects of the profession of audiology, including serving as the president of the American Academy of Audiology, chair of the Board of Governors of the American Board of Audiology, and president of the Ohio Academy of Audiology. She is also actively involved with interdisciplinary practice and education as part of interdisciplinary healthcare teams. Thank you, Gail, for joining us today as well. Thank you, Bree. And I think as everyone can see, we have uh, just extraordinary um, people as part of this panel. 
And I think we'll, I'll just get started with the first question. Um, and then I guess I'll throw it off to Lois first, since she was the first on my list <laughs> and who I introduced. Um, so how do you define what the new normal is for you? Well, you know, it's still in the process of being defined. Um, we, within our healthcare system, um, put in place a lot of new processes that we think will, will stay. Um, when the pandemic first started, we um, put in place an incident command center. We met for twice a day for weeks and um, we really came into this cadence of how we all work together in different ways and very kind of disparate uh, departments. And I think a lot of what we learned there uh, will continue. I know we're gonna talk a little bit later about uh, telehealth, um, but that will be, we think, a new normal within, um, within healthcare. Um, so we, uh, we're kind of waiting to see how things will all uh, play out. Thanks. Mary? Great. Well, I would say that the biggest change, I, as head of a healthcare trade association, interact regularly with members of Congress and the different administrative agencies. Um, but with this crisis, it has been ramped up to an unbelievable degree. And it feels more like we're just constantly putting out fires and trying to solve problems for our individual um, members. I'll give you a good example. And this was at the, one of the very first things we worked on. Um, trying to get health professionals to the areas where they were needed, the hotspot areas. And unfortunately, uh, let's use nurses as an example. Um, you may be licensed in one state, but it doesn't necessarily mean you can practice in another. Um, so we thought we could get a federal waiver and allow those nurses, as long as they were licensed in one state, they could practice in others. Uh, and quickly found out, and believe me, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services thought they could do a federal waiver and have that ability. And unfortunately, it took about a week and a half to find out uh, that, that would be unconstitutional. And so we wound up having to go state by state and get different governors to issue executive orders to allow for that practice. Uh, and that's something that has to be consistently renewed as those executive um, orders are uh, expiring. And then of course with Congress, uh, we've had these various COVID relief packages and everyone wanted to make sure that we're providing relief for the health systems, financial relief, uh, and a whole host of other issues. Uh, and then making sure that we can get waivers to do telehealth and get payment for that. Um, also some waivers of the current HIPAA privacy laws so it really has been a lot of nonstop uh, activity, um, but glad to report that we are getting some results. So that, that's the good news part of it. Thanks. How about you, Gail? You know, um, when I listen to Lois and Mary talk about some of the macro issues, um, the pivoting for us has really been a lot around a lot of the micro issues of direct patient care with people who have communication disorders. And I know in most states right now, they're talking about people with hearing loss. Um, you know, this pandemic has been amazing in terms of just something as simple as wearing a mask, which I know is controversial and isn't that simple, but you know, it should be that simple because of protecting others. But what it means to patients who have communication issues. Um, I work with a lot of children on our grant who have autism, and this is not an easy time for people. So I think the micro issues are huge, but also how it impacts people personally has really hit home for me and has hit home for our clinical staff. And also, um, I think for graduate students who are learning about this, you know, clinical education will never be the same because of, I know we're going to talk about telehealth, but because of all of the issues that we're facing related to that, but also how you interact with human beings when maybe wearing a mask is very difficult, not so much for them, but for them communicating with you. And let's face it, communication is what we're all about in all of this. So I think it's been um, an eye-opening experience for me to think about pivoting in a way that I'd never thought about before. Right, it's 
especially when thinking about, I have two littles, uh, kids, thinking about just them and then having to have a mask on and going into these clinics has to be incredibly difficult for them. Um, so what has been the most challenging part of the pandemic for you personally and professionally? Well, I'm happy to, oh, but I was going to say for me personally, not being able to visit my family in Florida. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm from a large family and I'm used to that regular uh, contact with them. So that's uh, been tough. Uh, and then, and I, I will admit this is a real first world problem, but my husband and I are big sailboat racers and we really do not feel comfortable being on a boat with six crew members during this time. So we had to put that activity on hold. Um, the one nice personal change for me is I commute from Annapolis, Maryland to Washington, D.C. It's about a 35 mile commute. Not having to do that has been a real pleasure. But on the other hand, and I would imagine all of our panelists feel this, working from home, I feel like I, it's almost impossible to step away from your computer and say, okay, enough, you know, just call it quits. So I find that I and my staff, everyone is working much longer hours than we did before. So for me, um, professionally, the idea that we're not face to face in a real way um, is, uh, you know, is tough. Um, I think uh, you all uh, on the call um, who, uh, you know, interact with people regularly in offices and in meetings know that a lot gets done informally. <laughs> so you're walking down the hall or you're in a meeting and we'll talk with someone afterwards about an issue and all of that has kind of gone away. So the meetings are much more structured. You know, you're in a Zoom from noon to one and that's it. Um, so I think that that for me professionally has been tough. Um, and just again, the interaction, you know, being responsible for what Multicare does in the community, um, not being face to face with that community has been tough to really get a sense of what's needed. And then personally, just, um, you know, not being able to go out and see friends and um, have, you know, dinner, be together with uh, extended family. So I think that I can echo what Lois and Mary have said about a lot of things that happen at work happen um, informally and face to face and that I really miss. Um, I think that doing clinical education and anyhow, I've been on a uh, task force to look at clinical education at Ohio State. So dentistry, optometry, medicine, you know, we we're all involved with that. and. It's a challenge because um, our students trust us to get high quality education and hospitals and healthcare organizations trust us to put out the very best product that we can so that they can hit the ground running and are prepared to, to do their jobs. And that's been an interesting switch. Um, I taught three classes last semester on top of everything else and moving from you know, being about halfway through the semester and moving everything to Zoom, it was really very challenging and very interesting and has taught me, a lot. I've been a professor for a long time. It's taught me a lot about teaching. It's taught me a lot about um, what students need and reading people online. Um, personally for me, I do improv comedy as part of a troupe as a hobby. And um, it's one of the very, if I can recommend it to anybody in the audience, improv is a fantastic thing for interpersonal communication. It's a fantastic thing as a stress relief. It's a fantastic thing to build relationships with other people. And I really miss my improv people. I'm the oldest person in my troupe by at least um, 30 years, actually. Um, and they're really great young people. And I think they adapt better than I do Although listening to them, we do some Zoom things, which isn't a very good way to do improv. Listening to them, most of them are millennials and um, this is really hurting some of them. They're, they're very anxious and depressed and 
So a lot of times we don't say funny things to each other anymore. We say things that are, I think, a little bit deeper relationship wise and, um, and really spending time listening to them has been useful, but I miss their faces and I can't wait to get back to it face to face and who knows when that might be. I've, I've been surprised. So we had to switch to a virtual membership meeting and we keep our membership small to about 50 CEOs of these, you know, multi-sector um, healthcare organizations. Um, so we probably would have with them and their staff, you know, about 150 people on a, a Zoom call. So we just had the CEOs on the screen. And I was very surprised at how interactive and dynamic uh, the discussion turned out to be. And uh, number one, our current chair is head of a health information technology company. So he was very comfortable managing the Q&A. Um, and we started with Secretary Azar as our speaker. But um, I, I just found that we had much more interaction than we might have had at a regular in-person meeting. And maybe it's because everyone's on the screen at the same time, rather than looking down a long hollow square table, uh, trying to figure out who's raising their hand. So that's been one interesting thing I found uh, because I was very concerned about being able to stay connected to our members, but so far it's worked pretty well. You know, I think another positive uh, is you know, I've been on um, a number of Zoom calls where, um, you know, one of the participants has their four-year-old come in and sit on their lap or, you know, the dog starts barking. And I think it, um, you know, you see people in their own environment and you see sort of the realness of their lives. And uh, I think that's good rather than just the, you know, professional uh, sitting uh, in a meeting room. And I guess I would add to that, in addition to seeing people's kids, I've also really enjoyed seeing people's pets. Um, <laughs> one of our AUD students has this incredible, very large cat that seems to be attracted to every Zoom meeting. And the cat shows up and it's beautiful. And I was like, yeah, I wouldn't have known that about her had yeah. we not had this experience. So I agree with you, Lois. I think that's a real positive. And I just have to say that we did get a um, comment in the Q&A about the pets since here, here. So <laughs> I think that's been a positive for everybody. Uh, so kind of going on to what you've all alluded to, um, do you think that telemedicine or telehealth visits will continue for routine care after the pandemic? Um, okay, I'll start that one then. <laughs> um, yes, definitely. You know, when we, um, when we were chatting earlier with our, our smaller group here, I mentioned that we had uh, gone from, oh, about um, 20 calls, 20 telemedicine visits a day to over a thousand uh, during the first height of the pandemic, uh, where people were, one, they were afraid to come in, um, and uh, you know, two, there really weren't facilities for them to come to that were open. Um, we've gone down uh, considerably from that uh, height, but we're still at least double what we were to begin with, uh, probably three times as much. Wow. And um, that's going to continue. You know, we found that, you know, in our surveying that once people have done that first telehealth visit, they're really open to doing more. Um, and our providers who weren't really sure that this was good care and that this was something that they were personally comfortable with are now saying, gee, this is great. You know, in Washington State and I think um, many places in the country, um, there are not enough primary care providers. And actually telehealth helps in that way. Um, things are a little more quick, they're more efficient, um, and uh, we have uh, less folks who are canceling appointments. Um, so we think that that'll help in that way. And then I think a third is, so, um, you know, telehealth had been used a lot um, in rural kind of settings and, you know, for different um, kind of specialists who, uh, perhaps would be at Ohio State and, you know, not 
um, in a small community and the ability to consult. Um, but what we've seen is that it's really been helpful and has been embraced for mental health. So, you know, we know within this pandemic that, um, you know, I've seen different surveys. One that I just recently saw from Kane Brothers um, stated that 45% of uh, folks um, felt their mental health had deteriorated during this pandemic. You know, we all know the reasons, the social isolation, the fear, and, and using um, telehealth in that way has been very, um, very good and very helpful. So we think that telehealth um, is definitely here to stay. Um, some of the work that Mary and others have done to um, make sure that providers are paid for those telehealth visits certainly um, is a, a factor. And just the consumers um, feeling that this is an okay way for care to be delivered. Yeah, I, I would just underscore what Lois has said. Uh, it has been exponential in terms of its growth. And, and the big question, you know, is it here to stay? Is it going to continue? And everything I'm hearing, uh, both from the government side, so we had been lobbying the Medicare program for quite some time to pay for telehealth, reimburse for it. Uh, and as a result of the pandemic, they're doing that. And they are now asking, should we continue this? And it is a resounding yes, continue it. Uh, and then the, the private payers, the commercial payers that are part of my membership, um, you know, Aetna, Anthem, some of the, the Blues plans, uh, not only is it here to stay in their view, but they really want to expand it. And they're willing to pay the hospitals and physicians uh, what they were being reimbursed for an in-office visit. So that's a big question too. What will the financial impact be for providers? Um, and as Lois said, you know, historically, I think people have thought of telehealth as a way to get um, more care to rural communities. And what we're seeing is it, it doesn't matter if it's urban or rural. Uh, one of our members is New York Presbyterian. They're using telehealth and have been for a while to better manage their emergency room, uh, to really talk to those patients before they come in to see you know, do you really need to come into the emergency room or, or can we address this in some other way? Uh, I think we'll see uh, greater efficiencies in the healthcare system and that's always a, a top goal, always being focused on the cost. But more importantly, we're seeing good outcomes for the patients as well. So we'll have to make sure we always have those two goals in mind. It's, yeah. uh, can we do it more efficiently but also get really good outcomes for the patients? Uh, and it's really nice to see that physicians are embracing this just as the patients are. So um, I think we're going to see a lot more of it. And it's, it's fascinating to watch. And I know on a personal level, it is much more convenient than going to that waiting room and waiting for your turn. So um, I think you'll see it widely accepted. I just had um, a couple of comments that maybe Mary, there were kind of off of what you were just said. So one of the panelists said, reimbursement for telehealth is critical to rural hospitals like mine. Quality care should be measured independently from the method in which it's delivered. So it sounds like that's pretty similar to what uh, your members are working towards. Absolutely. So again, you wanna make sure you're getting those good outcomes and that should be a mm -hmm. component of this. Um, but that quality of care should be whatever setting and whatever modality you're using. So I think I would probably add to what Mary and Lois have said, but probably more from a provider audiologist standpoint. I was one of those people who probably didn't think much about telehealth. I participated in some before, but it was rural health care. And during this time, I have a huge wait list for people who have tinnitus, who have ringing in their ears to do consults. And they often don't need to have a hearing test because they've already had that. But it's more of an information um, question answer support kind of a, a visit and that has been spectacular in terms of feedback from patients in terms of my my own personal experience I think has been fantastic with that and with our our AUD students with our doctor of audiology students they've gotten a really unique um, education that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise 
Um, one of the things that also hits home to me though, and having done some rural telehealth before, is I think the pandemic has really underlined some healthcare disparities, um, both for healthcare in office that we've always known about, but also even for things like telepractice, that if you don't have uh, good access to the internet, it's very, very difficult. And yeah, we can do some things by phone, but certainly there's some things that are better to see the person in person and to be able to do that. So I think it really also underlies some issues of how we need to be um, looking at some of these issues for now and into the future. Um, I know that in the United States, there's not universal coverage for internet access. And so for someone who may not have a computer or may have a computer, but have very spot. Oh no. Yeah. Um, some of these kinds of things up. So I think we'll have some changes in that um, into the future. I think that telehealth will be a fantastic way. I'm, I've done some of that personally with my own physicians and I didn't think I would like it. And I actually love it. I don't like sitting in a waiting room. Nobody wants to be sitting in a waiting room right now because of fear of you know, infection or whatever. Um, but also it's such an efficient use of time, both on the provider's part and on the patient part. So um, I think that's gonna be here to stay and I hope reimbursement will come along with it. And also loosening up with some things like, I really admire what you said, Mary, about HIPAA. Um, you know, that our speech pathologists have always been so worried about HIPAA, HIPAA, HIPAA. And um, you know, the fact that we can access patients effectively, efficiently and meet their needs um, while still being able to meet the letter or the intent of the law, I think has been a critical aspect to this. Yeah, I think one of the, the big unknowns about this administration, and don't want to get political at all, and I, I put the White House over here, but we do a lot of work with HHS, and they are very committed to this movement to value, getting better outcomes at, at better costs, but also they keep coming to the healthcare uh, sector and industry and asking, what are the regulatory barriers that are in your way of really doing the, the best uh, quality and, and most efficient care? And one of the areas they've been willing to focus on is HIPAA. You know, can we make it less onerous um, and allow speech pathologists and other practitioners to do what they need to do for the patient without constantly worrying about, you know, am I compliant? Uh, and really make it a, a much more sensible um, law. So that's been a plus. And I just want to underscore, you know, the need for infrastructure improvement in the broadband area. Uh, so telehealth is helping to drive um, the push for that. But also, if you think of all of the school systems that are trying to do online learning, and um, some have been successful, and others have failed spectacularly. And a big part of that is if you don't have that internet access, um, it's pretty hard to do that education online. So I don't know if it's something that will make it into the next COVID-19 legislative package, uh, but certainly if there's anything on infrastructure, there'll be a strong push uh, to improve that broadband access. It's just amazing of how much I think we've seen kind of to Gail's point as well that is really showing up if people don't have the broadband and they're living in rural areas that it's impacting their health, education, yeah. and possibly their work, their ability to work. So kind of talking about the telehealth, um, and I think this is mostly for Gail, I'm interested to hear, um, how do you see reopening of schools in the fall and the ability to provide important health services to children changing? That's a great question for me, Bree, because I'm on a task force with the Ohio Department of Health looking at hearing screenings, which some people may say, oh, big deal, you know, hearing screenings, we've got a pandemic going on. If you can't hear, you can't learn. And so very basic things like hearing and vision screenings um, being in schools, I think is very difficult. And what I found is that, um, we, I just looked at a document this morning related to this, um, there's not great guidance coming from anybody on this because there's not a unified approach to reopening public schools. Um, I feel very fortunate at the university that I work at. Our president has just accepted a new job, but he's a physician. 
and he lived through um, SARS when he was in California with the California system and was the chancellor there. And I think we've gotten really good guidance as a university, but I think Lois said earlier, you know, we're still learning all of this and it's following, in my opinion, a bouncing ball in terms of um, our governor is having a conference today and there's rumor that it's going to be related to closing some more things down. So I think it's very challenging to know how to open schools when you're in a situation, you know, whether that school be a, a you know, public school, private school or university, when you're in a situation where we don't even have a great handle on some of the data yet. Um, and it varies so much from urban areas to rural areas to, you know, thinking about things like busing kids, um, so difficult. Um, we're creating a video to teach people who are screeners to do hearing screening in the time of COVID. So what about gloving and masking and cleaning things down with cabicide wipes and doing that between each child, which adds cost to the process, it adds time to the process. And, um, you know, these are things that some of the screeners have never thought about or are being challenged to do so it's really kind of a, a brand new process for them and although we acknowledge it's important um, how do you get the resources to do that how do you you know normally when you do hearing screenings in school you bring a whole classroom down and it's kind of a fun little social thing and now kids will be coming down one at a time to have hearing screenings um, what do we do for you know I'm particularly concerned about kids who are on individualized education plans. How do they access their occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy services, um, reading services um, in the most effective way? Some school districts are having classes in the morning here and then kids will go home for the afternoon. So again, if you don't have somebody at your home, if you don't have somebody who can do internet with you, if you don't have internet access, it really limits us providing quality education. So those are the kinds of things we've been thinking about as we anticipate schools opening in the fall. And we do a lot of school consulting. Um, also our graduate students in speech language pathology, many of them do clinical rotations or placements in the schools. And we don't know what that's going to look like at this point in time. Well, I have to say as an employer, this has become an incredibly challenging issue for our staff that have children. And uh, it, as you said, Dale, there's no consistent answer as to how this is going to be done. Uh, they have to make a decision by today. Are they going to send their kids to school two days a week or are they going to do all virtual? And I had uh, one of my, and it's a younger employee who has four children and she asked if we would be okay with her homeschooling her children. So trying to work all that into their schedule and the resources being available and then another employee that does have a special needs child and has one of those special education plans, how are they going to access those resources? Um, it, it's a real dilemma for the parents, for their employers, uh, and for the, the health and education of the children. Um, and it's hard, I think, for all of us to look. I keep trying to look a year ahead um, when I'm talking to my employees. And I said, you know, let's just think about we need to get through this in the way that's best for you and best for your family but try to think, okay, what are going to be the long-term consequences of some of the decisions that people are making um, about well, their children? You know, when um, the schools uh, shut down in the spring, um, we worked with a lot of the community-based organizations um, to help provide uh, childcare for our employees and first responders. Um, so, you know, the Boys and Girls Clubs and the YMCAs and, um, and you know, we were able to kind of pull that all together. Um, and then we all breathe a sigh of relief, like, okay, it's summer, we can relax a little, but now <laughs> in the fall, we're trying again to figure out what about, you know, the nurse who has to be at work, but also has, you know, little children at home. So I think that's yet another complication. Yeah, um, and I think it's very much felt. I think, um, well, also in the academic, 
academic world, we're seeing a lot with the, um, just even women acad um, academics who have children, they've seen so much less um, papers come out from them and grant proposals. So mm -hmm. I think this is something that's definitely being felt all around. Um, the next question I had was, can you talk about the critical importance of crisis communication and education? I was particularly thinking about combating misinformation to the general public. Okay, I have to make a statement that may not be. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so um, it troubles us in healthcare that wearing a mask has become a political issue. And you know, wearing a mask has been proven to uh, slow down the disease. And the um, misinformation that's out there around um, mask wearing is something that we um, fight every day. You know, we, we had a policy within our, um, our system that everyone coming in for care has to have a mask on. We just got something uh, yesterday that says we don't want to turn anyone away. So if someone comes in and they don't have a mask, figure out how to provide that care. Well, you know, <laughs> if the rule is everyone needs a mask and everyone needs a mask. So, okay, that's maybe a political statement. It shouldn't be. Um, but the idea of uh, health information is just critical and, and correct information. You know, we work with um, the news media often. We work with the governments, um, the cities, and, you know, their um, information channels uh, for our own employees through our um, intranet. But that's um, every day that's an issue for well, I, I, I do miss the regular briefings from Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks. It was mm -hmm. calm, it was factual, just get the information out there and keep people aware. Um, but an upcoming issue that I am very concerned about, and actually Secretary Azar mentioned this at our membership meeting, and that is when we finally have a vaccine developed, and it does look like we're making good progress, uh, that there will be, as he phrased it, vaccine hesitancy. So I think healthcare providers, public officials, uh, there is just, I think, going to have to be a monumental public education campaign um, because this you know, really is the answer in so many ways for us getting through this. Um, but I know if you look at the take-up rate for the regular flu vaccine, it's an appallingly low 30%. And we're going to have to do a whole lot better than that if we're really going to get through this. Um, so that is kind of top of mind for my organization right now. You know, I, I guess I'll comment on what Lois said too, that from, again, from a more micro level, I've been impressed with our patients who've come in because now they're called ahead of time. They're told they must wear a mask into our building. Um, we give them medical masks when they come in so that they're clean and they're disposable. Um, they have to have their temperature taken. We go through the rigmarole of questions. And I've been really pleasantly surprised. I had armed myself to be prepared that people would come in with political issues, but they seem so grateful to be getting care that they don't That's great. come in and say, oh, I'm not wearing that mask. I did have a patient who came in with a um, red, white, and blue bandana, and um, I asked him to change his mask, and he said, I don't want to put that on, but I'd like to keep my, my patriotic bandana on to make a uh, comment. And I said, well, I love your patriotic bandana, but our rules are this here, and that's also patriotic because we're protecting your health and we're protecting our staff. And to me, that's one of the most patriotic things that Americans can do. And he gave me a little grousing about it, but he put the mask on. And when he was leaving, he had a great visit with us, and we asked him to come back and see us. And he said, next time I come back, I won't give you a hard time about the darn mask. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was good. Um, but that also takes a lot of energy and constant communication and um, I think those things are really, really challenging. 
And I haven't met anybody yet who refuses in our place, but we also have limited the number of folks who are coming in. And I think as that opens up a little bit more, we'll probably see some people who are very, very, um, who may be very politicized about this. Um, I think that our state had great crisis communication from our um, director of health, Amy Acton, who was, was a former Ohio State faculty member in public health and just did a fantastic, I mean, she was absolutely incredible in Ohio. And she has stepped down about a month ago and um, had threats, had people protesting with guns on her front lawn of her home. And that's just so disturbing that we can't seem to pull together and make this, you know, and this isn't political, it's just human nature, it's human. Um, you know, kindness and agreeing to disagree, but figuring out ways to get facts out there so that people can understand, um, I think is, is really challenging. On the plus side, <laughs> um, I think, you know, during this time where people are so glued um, to their computers and their phones, um, the um, being able to share uh, positive things and how people can help has been a real plus. You know, we know that in communities, you know, people when when you uh, kind of feel somewhat uh, helpless, the idea that uh, there's something for you to do is important and uh, so we've had um, you know different campaigns one of them is hope grows here where people within the community can take one small action of kindness whether it be um, putting a banner on their window thanking uh, first responders and um, essential workers um, whether it be delivering meals to um, healthcare workers fire stations, um, you know, all of that has really been positive. And we've used um, our, our communication mostly through um, our uh, web to be able to um, spread those kinds of messages and help to connect people. That's great. I'm going to look, I'm going to look up that uh, Hope Grows here. Um, so something that had that Mary said, it has been um, troubling me as well, and that's that uh, estimated low intake uptake rate of a vaccine. And we have a lot of researchers in the college that are looking at ways that we can um, communicate to people um, the safety and the importance of these vaccines. Uh, do you know, because there isn't a vaccine yet, Mary, are people planning on these health campaigns, communication campaigns to talk about the importance and how necessary they are? Oh, absolutely. And I sort of think back to when uh, Medicare, the Medicare program, Congress passed a prescription drug benefit for Medicare. Uh, and it was controversial. It was a, a close vote, um, but it became law. And then the, the question was, all right, how are we going to make sure that uh, the Medicare population is aware of this benefit uh, and that they sign up for it? And so we did a lot of outreach and enrollment events. And to me, that's the kind of thing we're going to have to do. Um, but we also did a lot of research on what is the best way to communicate, to get people to take action. And it varies by age group, so we'll have to keep that in mind. And, and I was really surprised. If we were talking about the, the senior population, uh, they wanted a, a trusted spokesperson that could talk do maybe a radio program for half an hour. Uh, when we were talking about a younger population trying to get them to enroll in health insurance coverage, much different, just a short, powerful message that told them, you know, what's in it for them kind of thing. So I think there'll be a lot of research activity going on and um, it'd be great to have uh, the School of Communication Arts and Science involved in that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then I think we're all going to have to make a commitment that we'll be willing to do that outreach and, and education uh, because it's going to have to be obviously a much better uptake rate uh, than we're used to. I am hoping because people have been so affected by this pandemic and it's been such a change in all of our lives that they will be more willing to do this um, so that we can all come outdoors again and meet with <laughs> each other again. So there may be a, a much stronger incentive. But believe me, the, the so-called anti-vaxxers 
it's a strong, very vocal group. And we're really going to have to make sure we educate people well about the value of doing this and the safety. And, you know, I, my go-to guy on this is Dr. Fauci. I just think he's a, a great calming presence. And the more we can use him, I think the better. Uh, thank you. So I, I'm just checking the comments. Um, so the last question that I really had was, and we, we briefly talked about it um, a little bit in regards to the um, access issues for the broadband, but I think we've seen a lot of um, different issues come up because of the pandemic, because of kind of the um, racial inequalities that are being highlighted by the George Floyd's death. So how do you see the social and racial equity issues that are being highlighted by the pandemic being addressed by the health system? Also speaking to that we've seen um, people of color have a higher mortality rate in the, with um, COVID-19. It was interesting. So originally it was portrayed as those with underlying chronic conditions were mm -hmm. much more at risk. Well, that minority population has a much higher incidence of diabetes and heart disease. And Lois, I'm sure you and your organization have been working on what we call social determinants of health. This has been a movement that's been underway, but it is what I would call the non-medical components of healthcare. Um, transportation to physician appointments, nutrition, making sure someone has a, a healthy diet, um, those are in, in housing. All of those things you don't really think of as direct medical care have a huge impact um, on, on healthcare. And I'm, I'm happy to report there's been a lot of bipartisan support in Congress for beginning to pay for those services. So we've just started down that path. I think this pandemic has just highlighted those disparities in health. Uh, and that minority populations are, are being much, having a much greater impact. And so we feel that we really need to accelerate this work and make sure that we're looking at the, the whole patient, the whole person, and providing them uh, both the medical care as well as the social care that they might need. Um, but this really has brought it to the forefront. I, I think the statistics have been shocking for both the Hispanic as well as the mm -hmm. African-American population. So, um, and I agree with everything that Mary said. Um, we found within our system um, the need to really be specific in our data measurement, um, you know, to look at race and ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, when we look at outcomes. Um, you know, you know uh, we know that if you measure it, then people pay attention to it. And I think that's one of the things that um, we're, we're doing more now than we did. Um, you know, we're also um, looking at, you know, how do we develop a culturally um, competent, proficient, sensitive, responsive staff? Um, you know, there's one thing, um, someone coming into um, a hospital or an ambulatory setting for care, but how um, they're treated and um, uh, what happens within that interaction um, makes a difference on whether they will come back or their family will come back or the community that they're a part of uh, will come in. So. Um, it goes beyond just the medical treatment to um, how, how do we uh, become a, a better um, healthcare system, better healthcare provider um, for really all of our patients. Gail, you are nodding. <laughs> yes, I love what you said. And I see myself on the front end of some of that. Um, I'm the Advocacy Council Chair for the American Academy of Audiology, and for decades I have wanted us as speech-language pathologists and audiologists to do a better job of recruiting people who look like the people that they provide services to, 
And um, ironically, when everything started to come up with the George Floyd situation, I went to my interdisciplinary team at Nysonger and said, how are your professions? We have 11 different healthcare professions. How are your professions doing this? And they all said, we're abysmal at it. So I think that we're going to see a positive that comes out of this as better better cohesiveness and thinking about how we do diversity and inclusion and starting that at the pre-provider level when we're recruiting students to programs, whether it be medicine or dentistry or optometry or speech and hearing, OTPT, that we're going to do a better job at this because of what you just said, Lois, that you know, um, one of the things that I think has been so critical in communication for me over the past two months has been listening and listening to people of color and black providers who informed us that they don't feel comfortable at our conventions because even people who have doctoral degrees feel discrimination in, in a group. And I, I was, you know, I, I was so surprised to hear this and so glad that they shared that because it's changing my perspective I feel like I have the opportunity to change healthcare on the front end, and I desperately want to do that because I want patient care to be better, and I want us to move ahead from this point that we're at. So if good things can come out of this, I think those might be some good things that do come out of it. And I, I think another important component of this is providing the incentives and flexibility to provide those services. So again, don't let regulations get in the way that you know, it's considered fraud and abuse if you're providing something of value to a patient that you're trying to induce a referral, those sorts of things. It just shouldn't be a factor. So we're beginning to see some flexibility. Uh, we're seeing private health plans beginning to pay for some of these services. And if we can line up those incentives, I think we'll see um, much better outcomes and, and take up for providing those services. Great. We did get a, a question from the audience. Uh, so there was just an NPR episode on this, excellent strategic thinking. How do we help create a more robust pipeline of future providers? So um, we definitely have to start young. Um, you know, go into the schools and, um, you know, talk about possibilities of you know, folks who look like this, the makeup of the class is important. You know, one of the things we um, did here uh, in Washington State, actually specifically um, in the Tacoma School District, is we began a healthcare careers academy where um, we focused on um, folks who were underrepresented within healthcare professions and um, we are now, let's see, we started with ninth graders. We're starting uh, now with 11th graders. So we've uh, gone up and added to those classes. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're giving those kids mentors and mentors mm -hmm. who look like them and believe in them. And um, hopefully that will uh, help move the profession forward, um, coordinating with the colleges and universities in the area. Yeah, I, I would just like to underscore that getting to them very young, not waiting for college, but definitely going into the high schools and, and even younger if possible, and getting them on that track. We've had this whole STEM education movement, which I think is very powerful. Um, I find it fascinating. I think we've made great progress with women. Um, that was the target group for so long. Yeah. And if we can get some lessons learned there and expand it to the minority populations, and see if that will work as well. Um, I'm on a board that grants a, a fellowship every year, and the, the, it was dominated by white males for the longest time, and now the majority of the board are women, but we realize we need much more diversity um, on the board. And I, I think every organization is really doing a kind of an internal look to see are you really diverse as you think you are? Um, so it's top of mind, I think, for a lot of organizations, and, and that's good. But I, I love the idea of going into those high schools and, and getting those kids early. Uh, another commenter um, 
says, my son starts MSU med school in August. Congratulations to, to you and your son. Um, we, but we do need more diversity in healthcare and in the systems to support these endeavors. The mentors need to stick with them throughout their college or throughout their careers and not just in college, which I think is a really great point to make sure uh, that people are successful in navigating those careers once they do graduate. Yes, definitely. Great. So it looks like we have about four minutes left. I don't know if anyone wants to have any concluding remarks. Uh, this has been great. Um, my brain has started like, gearing up and thinking of different research possibilities. Um, so any thoughts, Lois or Mary? <laughs> I just wanted to comment on, on the idea of, of mentors and um, the MSU College of Communication, Arts and Science. Um, they do a nice job. And I, I love the idea, and, and I know the alumni board that I serve on at MSU really has done a nice job of, they don't just take that student for a year, but they tend to follow them throughout their career. So I, I just wanted to underscore that. I think that was a, a great point you made. Yeah, it was great to be a part of this panel. It was really nice to meet um, Mary and Gail as well, uh, as fellow alumni. So. Um, happy to uh, be a part of this. Yeah, I would, I would say the same thing. And I've learned a lot today. And like you said, Bree, my head's spinning at the moment in terms yeah. of all the great things that we can do and accomplish together. And very proud to be a Michigan State alumni. Exactly. So I don't know if Meredith has any final words or? Yeah, just, some, just a quick again thank you to everyone and that's one of the most exciting things about these panels for us as well as watching you all connect with each other so it's such, you're all doing such wonderful and fascinating work so it's been really interesting today uh, thanks so much to our audience those of you out there and um, especially those that have been active in the q a we appreciate all of your feedback and insight uh, thank you brie for being a really fabulous moderator appreciate that thank you again to our panel and fantastic Spartans. We appreciate all of you taking the time today and look forward to providing you with future Comart Sci Talks. We are, there's nothing in the calendar yet, but we are working on a couple of upcoming topics. One talk around travel and tourism and media careers in that realm, another on corporate communication, um, and then something on education in the hopper. So stay tuned for that. Watch your inbox for follow-up email and survey and other coming attractions. And thank you again, everyone, and go green. Go white. Go white. Go white.